Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem at all. All right, so thank you everyone so much for joining me today. My name is Sarah Simones, and today I'm going to be discussing end of year giving um, on digital platforms, a nonprofit's guide. Um, first, I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. As I already mentioned, I'm Sarah, here's a picture of me. I am the head of strategy and training at Cause Inspired. <clears throat> My job includes enterprise level account management, um, internal training and team support actually for our entire marketing operations team. I spend a lot of my time developing integrated paid ad strategies with the Google ad grant and other platforms as well. Um, for anyone who might not know, Cause Inspired is a full service digital marketing agency for nonprofits. Um, we do specialize in something called the Google Ad Grant. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but we do everything really from content writing for SEO to paid ads on Google and non-Google platforms. And if there is one thing I want you to know about me today before we get started, it is that I have helped a lot of nonprofits with end of year giving strategies. So end of year giving is always such an interesting time of the year for nonprofits. It is super important. And I have seen really, really successful strategies. And I've also seen some strategies that had an opportunity to perform better. So that is going to be a huge goal today is making sure that you have both perspectives on that. All right, and then if you don't know, today's focus is going to be on digital end of year giving strategies. So we're not gonna be really talking a lot about traditional media. Um, we won't really be talking a lot about, you know, in mail um, advertising or anything that you might have word to mouth. Um, most of our focus is gonna be on these four categories, social media, organic search, Google ads, and of course the Google ad grant. And we're gonna really be focusing on how you can promote your existing or your planned strategy, strategies on those four digital channels. So um, yeah, that's a little breakdown there. And then let's kind of go over a bit of our session overview. So what are we discussing today specifically? There is going to be two sections to this presentation. The first is um, just an end of year giving review. We're going to be discussing what end of year giving is, how you can prepare um, and what makes a good end of your giving campaign. And then I'm gonna wrap up by helping you all um, uncover tools to find your audience on different digital platforms. This way you can have a good idea of where you want to focus your paid and your organic strategies for your 2022 end of your giving. Um, that said, the second half of this presentation will be breaking down strategies and best practices for um, those four channels I mentioned earlier, your organic search, your social media, your Google ads, and your Google ad grant. And I can see that we already have a couple of mentions in the chat. So I just wanna note that um, I will have some time for Q and A afterwards. If uh, this presentation is too basic and you maybe have a more technical question, more than happy to help. If it's too technical and you have a question that maybe um, is a little bit more at the beginning of your process, please feel free to pop it in the chat or hold it till the end. And I would be more than happy to help out. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with the million dollar question. What is end of your giving? I'm so happy you asked. So end of your giving um, from my perspective uh, is a combination of four things. The first is campaigning for donations ahead of tax season. I'm not an expert when it comes to taxes, but I mean, for the last um, half of a decade of my life, I have been working with nonprofits. So I know a thing or two about tax deductible donations. I know that last year, the $300 non-itemized deductions um, that, the, that we were allowed to, allotted through our taxes really did help encourage some more end of year donations. And that a lot of people do wait until the end of the year to get those itemized or non itemized donations um, for their taxes. So this is a great time to just be in the right place at the right time for a lot of people who are looking to donate. 
Um, the second thing that encompasses end of year giving is the giving season itself. So holidays, everything from Hanukkah to Christmas to Black Friday, people are spending a lot of money. They're purchasing for their friends and their family. Um, what better time to engage your audience and remind them to give back um, or to make a purchase in mind with your organization or your nonprofit. Um, and then the most obvious thing that the giving season or end of your giving uh, encompasses is Giving Tuesday. And this wouldn't be a proper session on end of your giving if I did not touch on Giving Tuesday. So I will be walking you through my personal Giving Tuesday checklist. I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas for things that you can do in your paid ads for Giving Tuesday. Um, and some things that are just not going to work for your paid ads for Giving Tuesday. Try to help save you some money for that. And then the last thing, and I would consider this probably the most important aspect of end of your giving, is that it is the perfect opportunity to nurture your donors. Um, definitely in mind with reaching your end of year goals. Around this time of year is typically when I have a lot of clients who say things like, I have $3,000 left in my budget, where do I spend it? Or I have to spend this much of a grant that we receive or else we're not going to get reapproved uh, re for it next year. Where should we put it? Um, those are really important things to do, and I don't want anyone to waste their money. So uh, nurturing your, your existing donors is a great way to encourage um, repeat support and kind of build up your um, power year over year when it comes to end of year giving. So I'm going to start off now with explaining a little bit about the timeline for end of year giving. This is also a question that I get a lot. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, approximately 31% of all annual giving um, occurs in December. And out of that 31%, 12% of all annual giving happens in the last three days of December. So um, end of year giving is not something to be underestimated. I know a lot of organizations who are listening along today or perhaps watching the recording afterwards, you probably already have an annual appeal that you have in mind for the end of the year. And it's just important to uh, think of ways that you can use that to engage your audience on digital platforms so you can capitalize on this interest in giving that just naturally happens in the last month of the year. Um, speaking of timeline, when should you start your end of year giving campaigns? I definitely want to go over this first before we start getting into the strategies, the meat and potatoes of things, because um, a timeline is everything when it comes to end of year giving, which is why we're having this session uh, in August and not October or November. Um, so take the time now to plan ahead for these dates because giving season really does start actually in November. So Giving Tuesday is November 29th, and then we have giving holidays starting um, December 18th, going all the way to January 1st. So giving season uh, really does begin in November, but remember during this time, those last two months of the year, we do have a lot of folks that are planning their annual donations for tax season, and perhaps November is not the month where you give a big ask like, hey, sign up for a monthly donation. Perhaps November is the month where you ask someone to sign up for your newsletter or to read um, a key piece of content um, or to fill out a form on your site so you can re-engage with them later. Uh, these could kind of be, that could kind of be a buildup month to your big month of giving in, no in December, uh, but I would consider both of them the time of year in which end of your giving starts. So when should you start planning? Um, I would say start planning as early as now. Uh, some people that I work with planned their end of year giving strategies last year or at the beginning of this year. Um, and then in terms of launching, November is a really good timeline for that. Now that's not to make you feel unprepared. Um, so I do want to kind of help give you some tools for what you can do to prepare your end of your giving strategies themselves. Um, some of these might be really obvious to a lot of people and others of these might be new things that you've never done before. I would just challenge you all to humor me a little bit and give them all a shot this year. They um, 
when combined together, they can all be really effective strategies. You might find something you like, and then you might find something that you uh, didn't necessarily work for you, and that is totally fine. So first, we're going to go ahead and begin with a Giving Tuesday checklist. Um, these are my six things that I always tell my clients to do when thinking about Giving Tuesday. The first thing is to find your local movement on the Giving Tuesday website. Now I'm gonna go ahead and note that this has not been updated for 2022 that I've seen, but we'll click and we'll take a look together. If you've never visited the Giving Tuesday website, this is it. It has a lot of really good benchmarks and trends for past Giving Tuesdays. Um, if you're board or if your team, if they're looking for benchmarks that they can kind of compare your industry to um, or uh, just general campaign ideas or strategies, the Giving Tuesday website's a really good place to start. Um, and where I would recommend you start is just by doing some uh, local investigation in terms of organizations around you and what they are doing. So how do you do that on the site? You're going to go ahead and start off by clicking the up our network section and underneath is going to be a drop down for find your local Giving Tuesday movement. When you click that, it's going to pull you down here to a giant map with all of the Giving Tuesday movements um, around the world. I'll start off in the US here and you'll click visit website and you'll notice they have their own section of the site. Scrolling down here, the US also has its own map. So all of these different red um, little text boxes with hearts in them are different movements that are happening in your areas. Some of them are linking to Facebook pages. Some of them are linking to microsites. Some of them link to full on websites. Um, and it can kind of give you an idea if there is something in your area you can join in on for Giving Tuesday or maybe an organization similar to yours what they're doing and maybe how you could um, replicate something similar for your organization. So that's always the first thing I like to recommend for Giving Tuesday um, is the Giving Tuesday website. A uh, quick side note to that, if you go under their resources tab, probably in like another month from now, uh, they should have some resources for like social media templates, branding, they've got all their logos, their official logos, free to download, everything's free on their site. So you can use that on your content if you'd like. The next thing I'm gonna suggest is to make a Giving Tuesday specific donation page. Um, if you work with a donor portal that allows you to have multiple donation pages or different versions of your donation page, this is really what I'm gonna suggest for you. It helps to have copy on your donation page that says words like Giving Tuesday in highlightable text rather than images. It helps to let people know if you have a specific Giving Tuesday campaign goal um, and how close they are to helping you reach it and what you're gonna do with that uh, donation. And it also is just a nice mobile friendly option for anyone who might be making a donation on mobile to have that reminder, oh yeah, it's Giving Tuesday. This is what I'm putting my money towards. Um, one thing that I think is going to be a little obvious for everyone is to plan ahead your organic and your paid social posts. Um, but I do find that a lot of people don't know you can plan your paid social posts um, ahead of time as well. So you can schedule your Facebook ads, your Instagram ads, even Twitter ads and LinkedIn ads. You can schedule those all to launch on a specific day. I would recommend a week to two weeks before Giving Tuesday. Um, go ahead and have them scheduled out, ready to launch as soon as possible. And that's going to just save you some headaches whenever Giving Tuesday comes around. Along with that, you can also start a Facebook fundraiser now and have it geared up and ready to go for Giving Tuesday. Just taking little things off of your plate is going to make the entire event a lot more digestible. Um, one other item that's a little unique that I like to recommend is to repurpose or create new blog content, co content that is surrounding Giving Tuesday. Um, so I started off with repurpose and that's something I wanna focus on. Uh, a lot of organizations that I've worked with in the past uh, thought it was like a taboo to reuse uh, content on your site, but it's actually a pretty good SEO um, tip for you. 
reusing content on your site, updating the date on it, the copy, making it relevant to 2022, not only repurposes an unused page on your site, um, but it already has historical data on it. You already have benchmarks for how that page might have performed in years past that you can compare to. Um, and it just saves you some time, honestly, so you can spend more time creating additional content. So a Giving Tuesday blog might look like uh, five reasons why you should support our organization on Giving Tuesday or top five things that we can do with um, a $100 donation from Giving Tuesday. But then there's also this aspect of talking around the topic um, on Giving Tuesday. So perhaps you want to um, engage your audience who has the potential to be a donor or could be interested in your content or your organization by writing about something they're interested in. A quick example of this could be if you know you have a lot of um, supporters on your site who are women or maybe let's say mothers um, or parents, maybe you have a child-based like nonprofit or an animal-based nonprofit or a nonprofit um, regarding like homelessness or hunger. Uh, those are things that maybe that demographic would be more interested in. If you're seeing that reflected in your donations as well, then I would gear content towards that audience. Um, you know, you could engage their children by saying like top five gifts for mom this holiday season. And one of those gifts could be like a donation in her honor. Um, different types of ways to talk around the topic that I think are really helpful. One of my favorite examples of this is a client of mine who wrote a blog about holiday crafts and had a call to action in that blog, a Giving Tuesday call to action about supporting um, children in poverty in their hometown. And it was a really effective content piece and it gave uh, me the opportunity from the paid ad side of things to bid on keywords that are cheap, um, like holiday craft ideas. And it also helped them perform better organically because that is a way more popular search term than where to give my money online is. So tons of different ideas that you can have there. I would just start off by um, deducing what would your audience be interested in, write a blog about that, and add a Giving Tuesday call to action to it. Along with that, you're probably during this time going to be scheduling out your email blasts, but I would recommend before you even do that to focus on increasing your newsletter signups. This is something that I'll talk about um, in the next slide as well when we go over your giving season checklist, but increasing your newsletter signups now is going to set you up for a lot of success in the future. So change a lot of your call to actions to um, sign up for our newsletter on the home page. You can have pop-ups for that, um, add that call to action on your most popular content, or maybe a button on your site included in your e-blast or on your social posts. Um, in some instances, I even recommend dedicating a social post a week to reminding people why they should sign up for your newsletter. And the reason why ultimately is definitely a little more selfish from my perspective. I think it's a really easy way to nurture your donors. That's why I'm 100% for having a newsletter and making sure your audience is signing up for it ahead of Giving Tuesday. Um, but it ultimately does have other benefits like being able to use that list for remarketing on Facebook or LinkedIn or Google ads. Um, and then also just being able to engage them on the day itself and ask them for their Giving Tuesday donation. And then finally, just to wrap up this section, this one might not be relevant for everyone, but um, inquiring on matching opportunities. I notice a lot of orgs who don't have employee matching call to actions on their website. And I think that's a huge advantage for a lot of donors. I know here at Cause, we've had um, a couple different times where there's been a specific world event or um, a tragedy and we have wanted to donate and we've asked for a matching donation and gotten that approved by our CEO. So um, there have been tons of opportunities for matching with employers. That's a great call to action on your site. There are tons of different websites that let people search to see if their corporation offers a matching opportunity. And um, in the theme of giving this season, uh, it's just a nice secondary call to action for your site. 
Here on the right, by the way, this is an example of a donation page that is specifically aligned for Giving Tuesday. There's a couple things that I personally would change about it, but I really like that it's mobile friendly, it's short, and that it gives you the opportunity at the top here to add in a description and a custom headline. So you can say things like donate uh, in honor of Giving Tuesday or learn more about what we're using your Giving Tuesday donation for. And now that I've probably said the word Giving Tuesday 100 times, we are going to veer away from that and talk a little bit more about the giving season in general. So um, the first thing, pretty obvious here as well, is to start planning your campaigns and your appeals early. Um, I say that because I'm thinking digital campaigns. If you have a written annual appeal that you mail out to everyone and you have that on a PDF on your computer, that's a great opportunity to copy that and to turn it into a blog post or a landing page so that way you can drive organic social traffic to it, organic search traffic to it, or even paid traffic. Um, this planning process of planning out your campaigns has to involve a couple of different things, such as uh, uncovering who your audience is, uncovering how much budget you want to spend, deciding which platforms um, you can target your audience on, and kind of making some goals and some benchmarks for yourself. So the next thing that I recommend for giving season is to review last year's performance. When I'm going over my year end performance with my clients, I always put on a year over year comparison so we can see if we improved or um, if we did not improve. That's really helpful because it gives you an idea of things that worked and didn't work um, all for experimenting. I think you're going to have more success when you experiment than you will if you don't do it at all. So that is a great opportunity to reflect and see if what you did last year is something you want to repeat. Um, as a side note to this, this is also a good opportunity to look at your major demographics for your top donors. When I say demographics, I don't mean um, anything really related to who they personally are, but I mean big picture items that we can deduce from their behaviors on your site uh, and their interests and their location. So where do you get that information? It does depend on what platforms you're running, but for the most part, you can get this in Google Analytics. I would look in Google Analytics under your audience section in the geographics tab. You can see all of the different locations that your users are coming from. You can add a filter in there for your donation page and just see location-wise where are your donors coming from. You can also, if you're running Google Ads or Facebook Ads, you can look at your age range demographics and you can look at your interest demographics inside of those two platforms just to see what your users might be interested in. This is a good time to figure out what that audience is um, coming to your site for so you can re-engage them with that or so you can possibly run like an acquisition based campaign to target people who are similar to them. As I mentioned uh, previously, build up your newsletter subscribers and your remarketing lists. Um, I also mentioned previously to plan new content surrounding holiday themes. This is similar to my Giving Tuesday um, blog recommendation, but now you have the opportunity to really open it up towards holiday copy. I even recommend to our team internally that we um, that we rewrite a lot of our Google ad grant ads to have holiday copy in them as well. So tis the season to give or happy holidays in there. Little things like that can make a difference. They make your ad feel more personal. Same thing with your social posts can help. Um, making things feel a little bit more giving season-y um, can be just the touch that you need to drive some more eyeballs to your website so you can build up a good brand reputation with new users or existing donors. Um, and then next, and this is a part of your planning portion of this, is to set your budget and plan which platforms you want to engage your audience based on, uh, based on their age and devices that they use. Uh, and so I'm gonna deep dive that on the next slide. I can give, I'm gonna give you some statistics for what platforms your audience will be on. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna wrap this up by saying, 
Um, you should also update your information on um, websites like Candid, which used to be called GuideStar, or if you prefer Charity Navigator, that is also an option. But I personally know updating your info on a website like Candid does connect you with different giving platforms like Facebook Giving and Amazon Smile, which can also be used in the giving season. So make sure you do that. Check out your profile there so you can see what your donors um, are able to see about your nonprofit. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit about features of good end of year campaigns. So these are some pieces of advice that I have in terms of logistics and tone um, based on the successes and like I said earlier, the non-success of end of year campaigns that I've seen. So the first thing I'll say logistics wise is you have to drive awareness before you drive a goal. It's gonna be really difficult to ask someone to complete an action if they have no idea who you are. Um, so it's important to start driving awareness on multiple platforms. I would say organic awareness is fine enough. Um, regular Facebook posts, Twitter posts, Instagram posts. Um, make sure you find your audience where they're at. We will talk about that. Um, but it's just important to get the awareness factor out there before you ask someone to give a gift. Um, after that, I would say logistics wise, it is best to have multiple ways to give through a mobile device. Increasingly, year over year, we're seeing more folks are giving through their phones than ever before, rather than on a desktop. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone here. Um, donors sometimes are discouraged from donating if your form is too long, if it's too complicated, if you don't accept a payment um, form that they have. So I would suggest taking the time between now and November to set up on PayPal, Venmo, have a Facebook fundraiser running, GPay if you can, anything um, that you could do to make it as easy or as accessible as possible. There are also tons of different free text to donate platforms um, that you can engage with. And that just makes it a lot easier when you're running an Instagram ad or when you have an organic Instagram post so a user can just click to donate right away rather than going to your site and scrolling through a long form on their phone. Um, finally, logistics wise, I would say um, more is more when it comes to giving season. And it's okay to segment your ads and your targeting based off of your demographics. So age range and interests, um, and then meet your audience where they're at. If you are only seeing that you're getting donations on Facebook, then definitely gear your audience more towards that like 35 to 45 year old age range. Um, trying to be really trendy and like appealing to Gen Z on a platform like Facebook or Instagram might not be as successful um, and you could possibly lose out on some potential donors. So I would say to cater to the audience that is most likely to be on the platform that you are advertising on or uh, having social posts on. And then in terms of tone, these are probably the three most common things that I see um, nonprofits either doing really successfully or not at all. So the first is to give your audience options. Um, I kind of just mentioned this with segmenting your ad campaign, but not in every situation is someone gonna understand the value of donating to someone who's struggling in poverty if they've never been uh, through that experience themselves. So you kind of have to give them different call to actions than you would someone who has experienced that before. Maybe they're going to appeal more to helping a community call to action rather than to helping your neighbor or to giving back to their hometown more than they would to helping those that are around them. And I know those seem like really minute differences, but they do make the biggest uh, impact on the success of your campaign. So let your audience support what matters most to them. Give them options when it comes to giving. I've even seen really successful campaigns where people let you choose what you want to donate to. Do you want to donate to... Um, give a bike to uh, these kids in this location? Or do you wanna to donate to provide healthcare for mothers in this area? Uh, little things like that can be really effective. 
The next thing I want to say is, and this is kind of a little controversial, but tell your users where their money is going. Um, this is a personal love as a donor myself. I am a monthly donor to a couple different organizations. And what uh, changed in me a couple years ago when I started doing that is when I realized how much money I was paying on television subscriptions like Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus. I was like, wow, I'm paying that every single month. I don't even use them all every single month. And I won't even make a $10 donation to an organization. So um, putting it in perspective, what $10 does for your organization also helps put it in perspective for the donor of what they would use $10 for. So it could be really helpful if you would say $10 um, helps us raise, you know, 10 different or helps us buy 10 different cans of food for this uh, food pantry um, or this specific campaign. And then, you know, your average cup of coffee is $5.99 or whatever. And so this is basically two cups of coffee for you a day, which I am absolutely um, guilty of. So yeah, put it into human speech. Let people know what a dollar does for your organization. Let people know what a hundred dollars does for your organization. Um, transparency really does lead to more donations. There's tons of research on it. And yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. I'd love to see more. And then finally, to wrap it up here, and this is something that a lot of nonprofits do well, which is share your story. Um, talking about donor impact, real life donor impact is always going to be more effective than the numbers at the end of the day. People love a success story. Um, they love to see a picture painted for them of how your organization has helped in previous years. So these are both the logistics and the tone best features I see in end of year campaigns. So where's your audience? We have talked a lot about how to target your audience, what you should say to your audience, but the big question still remains where should I be running these ads? Where should I be putting my organic social posts? I like to start off with segmenting this by age range. And the reason why um, is because I'm gonna focus on social media and social media is very divisive uh, based off of uh, your age range. You might like different platforms. So I've got some percentages for you here on which platforms your audience might be on. It is up to you to go into your analytics, look at your age range demographics or your Google Ads accounts and look at your age range demographics to figure out which of these platforms you might be most successful on. So starting off with 15 to 25, 25% um, 25 of all users on TikTok are between the ages of 10 to 19. You really don't know many 10 year olds that are donating, but 18 to 19, um, is a really good age range to start introducing brand loyalty to, especially for, for um, charity and advocacy. Um, so that could perhaps be a good platform for you. 42% uh, of everyone on Twitter is between the ages of 18 to 29. And this one is really interesting to me because Twitter is very much so a platform um, that I don't personally like to use. Um, but that I do really like to run ads for. And the reason I like running ads on Twitter is because all of your ads are super shareable. They're very easy to like, um, easy for people to comment on. So you get people's opinions right away. And ultimately it's just an effective platform if you're looking for brand engagement and brand awareness. Um, now YouTube's highest reach is between the ages of 15 and 35. So that means that YouTube um, reaches like geographically and impression wise the most with the ages of 15 to 35. That's why it's in both the early donors and then like this middle age donor range here between 25 and 40. And it's also going to be in our 40, 40 plus um, audience here because YouTube's second highest reach is with users that are 45 and up. So YouTube is a really good, good platform for driving awareness, for giving smaller call to actions for your brand. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great starting point if you really don't know where your audience is. Snapchat, 48% uh, of everyone who uses Snapchat is between the ages of 15 and 25. And for Instagram, 30% of all of those users are between 18 and 24. 
Now, these next two bubbles, uh, they kind of have similar information, but just um, one or two different platforms here. So for our donors ages 25 through 40, you're gonna really wanna be targeting them on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, and uh, Twitter as well. So Facebook and Instagram is really popular for ages uh, 25 to 34. That's about 31% of their total audience. And that does include Facebook stories and Instagram stories and Instagram reels. Those are all good spots for you to be on for end of your giving. LinkedIn, a personal favorite ad platform of mine, 58% of that audience is 25 to 34. Um, great opportunity to engage someone on completing an action. Because typically when we are on LinkedIn, we're a little bit more action-based. People might be applying for jobs. They might be writing content or posting content that they've written. It's in most cases, not a very scrolling um, platform. It's typically a little bit more intention-based. Um, and then we've already talked about Twitter and YouTube. So the last one that I'll mention here is for donors 40 and up, which are donors that I typically try to target for a lot of my clients. We're gonna wanna focus on platforms like YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Pinterest is a good one for this audience because over 38% of users that use Pinterest, primarily women, and they're also between the ages of 50 through 64. So there are some uh, quick facts for you on recognizing where your audience is. This is like the tip of the iceberg for audience research. That's definitely something that can take a lot of time. I would recommend starting off with age range and then from there, looking at trends on the platform that your audience is on. All right. So now you've found out where your audience is at. Maybe you have a good idea of which platform they are mostly on. So what's next? I have four next steps for you. And these are going to be in line with planning your strategies for a paid ad platform or an organic ad platform of your choice. So the first step is to always increase your awareness on your choice platforms. If you just found out today that maybe your audience is on Pinterest or Twitter and you haven't run any content on there, don't start off with ads. Start off with something organic, try to build up your awareness first and then focus on capitalizing on your um, branding on those platforms. So awareness and reach is so important to focus on now before the giving season really begins. Next is to nurture your existing donors with content and branding. Um, I think oftentimes we forget that existing donors also need to be nurtured and need awareness campaigns for themselves as well. Um, so many times do I see a nonprofit that I used to support and follow that has a completely different brand um, and I don't even recognize them. So if you've got updated branding, if you are planning a specific appeal or a campaign story, share that with your existing donors first. That can feel exclusive. That can feel um, like they are making an impact for your organization and you're rewarding them. Uh, but also just to nurture them on the platforms that they are at is really helpful. These next two items um, really kind of align with each other. So the first is to build your brand reputation on your choice platforms. And when I say brand reputation, I mean what you're known for. Are you known for having a funny tone or a serious tone? Are you known for um, calling people out, calling organizations out? Um, are you known for um, making a really big impact? So make sure that you have your brand reputation solidified before you dive into end of your giving. I personally really love following nonprofits that share um, easy to look at graphics. And that's totally selfish of me, but I'm willing to admit it because it's easy for me to digest. I'm a visual learner. I love visuals and graphics help me um, understand information more and make a bigger impact for me. So understand what your brand reputation is on your choice platforms and take time to shape it. How do you shape it? With experiments. Uh, experiment with new platforms ahead of giving season. I don't want anyone to leave today and think that I said to start off in November with LinkedIn ads if you've never run them before. Definitely give yourself like a $100 or $200 testing budget. See how that goes initially um, and then kind of dive into using those platforms during giving season.
So um, it's time to start talking about those four categories that I mentioned earlier and how you can apply strategies and best practices where it matters most on those platforms. First up, I believe, is social media. Awesome. So let's start off with organic posts. Organic posts is going to be the easiest to talk about because it's free and pretty much everyone has organic social posts. Um, if your organization has a Facebook page and you're posting on it, then you are working on your organic social media. So my first recommendation for the strategy on your organic social is to gear your copy towards your largest audience. We briefly mentioned this, but if you have a specific age range or an interest on that platform, cater to them before you try to cater to everyone. It's better to have success with your top group than to not have success with any group. Um, so if that means hopping in on a funny trend um, on TikTok, or if that means sharing um, an impactful video that might feel a little sad, but is truthful and dramatic maybe on Facebook. If you know that's gonna appeal to your audience, cater to them first. Um, the next thing that I've already kind of mentioned, but just to reiterate for organic is to schedule posts in advance and coordinate them across multiple platforms. Um, a common mistake I see in giving season is that we copy and paste our copy on Facebook and we paste it on LinkedIn and then we paste it on Instagram and then we paste it on Twitter and um, you're just giving people the same exact message on multiple platforms, it's probably not going to be the most effective strategy. So think about the things that set your platforms apart. On Facebook, you can use hashtags. On LinkedIn, you can use hashtags as well. On Twitter, you can also use hashtags, but they're all three different types of hashtags. Facebook, you'll probably wanna to stick to um, shorter links, you do get a social card that pops up on your post on Facebook. So that's important to consider. You'll probably want less copy for a nice mobile experience um, versus on LinkedIn. A lot of people are using desktop for LinkedIn during the workday. So you have an opportunity to have um, longer bits of copy on there. Definitely use hashtags on your LinkedIn. A lot of people search that way. LinkedIn filters a lot of organic content that way. Ask your audience questions, ask them to comment engage, maybe they can add a reaction or a like based off of what they think. Um, yeah, find different ways to engage them based on the platforms that they are and schedule those posts in advance. Um, and then the next thing I'll say is to cross promote your content. So earlier I mentioned a lot about blogging and content writing, but that's not just for uh, letting it live on your website and perform. Definitely push those things out on social. If you have header photos on your blogs, when you uh, copy and paste that landing page into your Facebook post, it's going to automatically pull through a social card. You can use plugins on your website if you have a WordPress website for something like Yoast. So you, and that's Y-O-A-S-T for anyone who's interested. So you can manually change your social cards. And that can just make your organic post look more appealing, give it a better image, a better headline. Um, cross promoting your content uh, is so key to having successful blogs because it can give you a boost in engaged users on your site. And then I'll also say for paid social posts, I have some recommendations. The first is if you are running Facebook ads, especially, I would challenge you to not create your audience targeting when you're making your ad. Instead, I would recommend you log on to your Facebook ads account, go up in the top left-hand corner, there should be some three lines there, click that and choose audience manager and go to audience manager and create your audience there. Take your time, look at how large it is, look at how small it is, um, add on different demographics, make multiple versions of it, and save those. Then when you go to create your ads in the future, you can apply the existing audiences that you've already made, and you have set up targeting that matches specifically different age ranges, locations, and interests. I say this because um, it's important to gear your copy, especially with paid ads, on those platforms to specific uh, audiences. And that also works for Instagram as well. Of course, Instagram is through Facebook. 
for social platforms like Twitter or LinkedIn, where maybe you don't have that much control, I would say um, to actually target people who are already following you. You can definitely do that on Twitter. Um, you can do that a bit in LinkedIn, and you can also definitely do that in Facebook. You can give them strategic call to actions. It's kind of like a boosted post with a little bit more um, thought put behind it. So uh, those are my recommendations for your paid social and your organic social. All right, and let's talk about organic search. This one is uh, probably where we're going to get the most technical. I have a lot of recommendations for organic search. And these are, excuse me, <clears throat> these are all things that are probably going to take a little bit longer for you to accomplish. Let me just take a sip really quick. Yes, so you're going to want to set aside some time for this. The first one is really broad, but so important, which is optimize your website, increase your website load speed. Um, reduce the number of iframes on your site and try to only use pop-ups strategically. What do I mean by that? Um, there's many different ways that you can increase your load speed. The first way that I would recommend is just by figuring out what your load speed is. So you can Google website load speed and a Google developer tool will pop up. Um, I believe it's called like Google Speed Insights. You can put your URL in there and you can figure out how fast your website is loading on desktop and mobile. It will give you recommendations for things that you can do to improve that. Um, that is a really major thing to do because if your website is taking too long to load for your SEO content, um, it doesn't really matter how good your article is, it's not going to perform well. What is an iframe? An iframe is when you don't pay for a widget, maybe you're using a free version of it, or when you're using a widget that was built on another site that is like in a box on your website. You will know something is an iframe if you right click on it and it has an option to view frame source. That means it's an iframe. If it's an iframe, Google really cannot read it. So you're gonna want everything on your site in highlightable text or at least your SEO content in highlightable text. And then strategic pop-ups. Um, I love strategic pop-ups. I think they can encourage uh, people staying on your site for a longer amount of time. Um, I love to use Optin Monster personally, but you can schedule a pop-up that it goes off whenever a user starts to navigate to the exit button or the back button. So that way you can give them a final call to action before they leave. Little changes like that can increase the average time on page for your site and um, your organic ranking. Next, I'm gonna suggest uh, to use internal linking. Um, we talk a lot in SEO and the SEO world about external linking, link out to good sites. Everyone says, you know, have good sites link out to you. Does that help? Absolutely. Um, but internal linking helps a lot as well. So link existing pages on your site to related topics. What do I mean by that? If you write a blog about um, how much it would cost to end homelessness or houselessness in the United States, and you're an organization that helps with that, link your, um, link your process for how your organization helps with that on your blog. Uh, don't take someone off site. If you have the opportunity to have your donation page on site, link it there as well. If you don't, um, you know, definitely still link it out if you're looking for donations, but focus on internal linking first as much as you can. Try to bring people to different pages on your website if they visit multiple pages per session, Google is going to view that as a very engaged user. That's super helpful for you. I already mentioned this earlier, so I won't go over it too much, um, but recreate your existing content, um, reuse your existing content, make sure it's up to date, and then optimize your content for mobile. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can test out your content for mobile by right clicking on your screen and inspecting something. I will give you an example of what that looks like on the Giving Tuesday website. So when I'm on the Giving Tuesday site, I can right click here, I can choose inspect, and it will go ahead and show me what it looks like <clears throat> in different phone sizes. Do this, I do this for Pixel because I have a Google phone, um, but here you can see that it is cutting off um, some parts of the header here. I can't see the menu. 
I can redo this for an iPhone. Maybe it's a little bit more optimized for iPhone, but view your website, see how it looks on mobile and optimize it for mobile specifically. And then finally, analyze your existing search intentions, which basically means do keyword research, even for your organic content. Use Google Trends, use Google Keyword Planner. Um, you can use Uber Suggest. There's tons of different free tools online that you can use to do your own keyword research to optimize your content with. And um, next, we're going to talk about Google Ads. I have a lot to go over here. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is just general Google Ads best practices. I've worked in Google Ads more than um, any other platform I've, I've worked in during my career. So this is where I have the most knowledge, of course, and probably why I've got the most suggestions here. Um, but my best practices are these three. First, always start with a test budget. Um, I like to give my clients a week to two weeks to test our campaigns before we officially launch them with full budgets. You know, to give yourself $100 for one week um, might not feel like a lot, but it really does make a big impact and it can save you a lot of stress if something is wrong or not correct with your targeting. So uh, that also helps you know what your average cost per click is with each audience. So that way you can budget accordingly. If you get into your campaign and you see, wow, my audience is only 15 cents per click and they're coming to our site, then maybe you wanna increase your budget. Or if you see that your audience is like $5 a click, maybe you decide that that cost per click is not worth the return on your ad spend. The next thing I'll say is to segment your ad copy to match your call to actions um, that appeal to each audience. You know, someone who is maybe younger is not going to appeal to a sign up for our newsletter call to action. They probably would go for something like subscribe or follow us, get the latest. Um, and then maybe somebody who is older is gonna look for something that's a little bit more transparent and want to know exactly what they're signing up for, sign up for our monthly newsletter would be a little bit more convincing for them. And then finally, I'm gonna say that your landing pages, they do need to be unique and they need to match your ads. Your homepage is not a good landing page for strategic end of your giving ads, don't do that. Run ads on specific landing pages that align with the campaign that you are looking to gear your audience towards. Um, that is going to lead you to the most success. Next, some pieces of advice for these next three categories, YouTube ads. Only run YouTube ads if you have good video content. I would recommend videos that are 30 seconds or less, but you can go up to a minute. People do watch those. Um, I would also say that YouTube is definitely an awareness more than an action platform. Uh, these ads are going to be able to show before, during, or after a YouTube video. I really don't remember the last time me or anyone else that I've talked to has watched a YouTube video that's maybe like a half hour long and then just clicked off of it to go do something else. People are typically using this as TVs, they're dedicated. It's kind of hard to get someone to leave something they're very interested in. So make sure that this is a good moment for you to build awareness. Next for display ads, I'm gonna say don't run static image display ads run responsive display ads. It's easier on your team, it's faster, you've got way more different areas you can show up in. All you have to do is sacrifice a little bit of brand control and ad control. Um, you can add up to five headlines, five descriptions, five image assets or video assets and a call to action button. And Google's gonna make up to 500 different ad variations for you automatically. Um, and then I'm also going to say this, go ahead and decide ahead of time for your display ads if you want to run on apps. If you don't want to run on apps, exclude that from the beginning. Um, and as you're optimizing your campaigns, make sure you're monitoring your placements every single week for display. If you're trying discovery ads this year, if you don't know what discovery ads are, that's totally fine. But if you do and you're trying them this year, uh, you need to make sure all of your content's mobile friendly. Discovery is like a mobile ad placement, mobile ad network. So if your content's not mobile friendly, if your ad's not mobile friendly, your ads are probably not going to perform very well. And then I'll also say for discovery ads, 
that um, they're more successful when you use like blog content or written content that somebody can read through, not just like specific, go ahead and donate money, call to action. So you're gonna wanna give someone an article that they can go through or a listicle, top five things you didn't know. Anyone who's interested in knowing more about discovery ads, I will just basically say they are a new type of ad that Google offers that runs ads on the YouTube homepage, Gmail, and then the discovery network, which is what you see on your phone when you're Googling something and you start to scroll down and articles pop up. Um, so if you want to know more about it, definitely give it a search or feel free to stay after the call and I'd be happy to give some more information. All right, and finally here, I want to talk to you about ad grants. Um, this is possibly where you can have some of the biggest impact for end of year giving. And I'm not just saying that because it's what we focus on. It's because it's where I've personally seen the biggest impact for end of year giving. Uh, what is a Google search ad really quickly? It is the text ad that appears whenever you search something on Google. Um, it shows up at the top three positions there. And a Google ad grant is available for nonprofits, uh, 501c3s, and it is $10,000 a month of paid search ad spend. You can use that to drive traffic to your site, to increase your conversions or your goals that you're looking to accomplish. And it's gonna give you demographic info on your audience. So it'll tell you a lot of the answers to questions I've asked you today. Like what age ranges are you targeting? Um, what locations are, are, is your audience located in? Uh, what are their interests, um, their household income, their gender? Tons of different things that you can see on Google Ads using a Google Ad Grant. So two questions I want to answer right now. The first is, what can you do for Giving Tuesday? You can create a Giving Tuesday ad group in your account and bid on the keyword Giving Tuesday. Is it going to perform very well? From my experience, I don't think so. There's a lot of competition that we see with the keyword Giving Tuesday because a lot of donor portals bid on the keyword Giving Tuesday and they hike up the cost per click to be really, really expensive. So my suggestion to you would be to write strategic content surrounding Giving Tuesday and advertise that with your grant. Then you can bid on keywords like ways to give and matching donations. And if you really want, you can still bid on Giving Tuesday if possible. I would also say um, a really good recommendation for Giving Tuesday is just to change your landing pages for the day or for the week um, ahead of time. So if users are searching for your names, we'll use Cause Inspired, for example. Say someone is Googling Cause Inspired and they see our ad. Instead of landing them on my homepage, I would land them on my Giving Tuesday page. Maybe it says celebrate Giving Tuesday with us this year. And then finally, what can you do for the giving season? Um, create holiday content that doesn't reference your donation. Uh, that's so important for the grant. It's great for building awareness and for nurturing your users during tax deductible donation season. Um, and then I'm also gonna say, to just offer more call to actions for your newsletter. And one thing you can do in the Google Ad Grant this year that we've never been able to do in years previous is um, remarketing. So I would even say remarket to the people who looked at your content that did not have a donation call to action and give them a donation call to action. Remarket to people who um, have signed up for your newsletter and give them strategic call to actions as well. Okay. I had to go a little quickly there in the end because we we're running out of time, but thank you again, everyone for joining today. I hope that you got one or two things out of this that was interesting or unique for you. Um, if you have any questions or if you're interested in how Cause Inspired can help you specifically, feel free to reach out to us on our website, causeinspiredmedia.com. And thank you again for joining. I'm open for any questions that we might have. Okay, and I do see in the chat, we do have a couple of questions here. So the first one, for anyone who's interested, there will be a recording sent out um, of this in a follow-up email. 
um, you can apply for the Google Ad Grant um, on Google for Nonprofits. So just search Google for Nonprofits. It's the first option that you'll see there, and it'll give you some qualifications. Um, if you're interested in applying for that through us, uh, we do donate the grant procurement process uh, once you sign on for one of our packages. So feel free to let us know if that's something that's interesting. And I believe those are everyone's questions. So it's three o'clock. Thank you all again for joining. Okay, perfect, Philip. Um, you can uh, contact us on our website. Um, in fact, I can give you a specific email address right now. And I will send, we can send you some package info. But I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and thank you all for joining again.